is. Uh, we looked at all the, the we looked at the statistics, and as you can see, there's no place that comes anywhere close to the South. It's almost twice as, as violent as any place else in the United States. Almost, not quite. Why? What's going on in the South? Well, there's a lot of people had uh, explanations for it. We don't need to talk about Andrew Jackson marrying a woman who was already married to somebody else. Making her a bigamist, of course. So he had to kill the other guy, and he did. But we can talk about people purring, which sounds like they're being nice to one another, but instead they're actually kicking each other in the shins. Not something that you would see in, uh, in Tuba City, but uh, it's something that uh, they do in the South from time to time, as strange as that may seem. Lots of different... Uh, Oh, so if we look at, at all the violence in the South, we can see that they have uh, they, uh, corporal punishment is more common down there. Um, capital punishment for criminals is more common. Gun ownership is more common. Uh, they want to go to war. Uh, the high school students are more likely to bring a weapon to school, even more likely than, than gangs in, in urban areas. Uh, Southerners are still more likely to... Uh, to bring weapons, uh, and they also have more school shootings. Uh, shooting in California, those of you who are in my other class, I already talked about this. Six people killed in Bakersfield. Let's go ahead and figure it out what the, uh, in the world is going on. I don't know why it's doing that. If I touch it, it'll go away. I'm just going to leave it. Okay. Lots of ex explanation as, as to why. Um, uh, it's hot down there. It's humid. It's hot and humid, just like uh, uh, just like the uh, Vietnam is hot and humid. <laughs> subtropical. It's subtropical. Lots of poverty down there. A lot of poor people. Uh, difference between rich people and poor people down there has always been extreme. Uh, for the longest time, of course, they owned slaves until 1860s. Uh, so you had slave owners and you had people that didn't own any slaves. If you didn't own any slaves, you were SOL, as it were. Uh, so there was a huge difference between the rich people and the poor people. And if you think about it, or if you wonder, this is one of the things that I was wondering, why in the world would those poor people fight for, for the, the uh, slave owners? Why did they do that? And the answer is there were a whole, it, there were a lot of places in the South where the poor people did not fight for the South. Uh, you've seen the movie, or maybe you haven't seen the movie with Matthew McConaughey about Jones, the independent nation of Jones or something, in the middle of Mississippi. Uh, but that, that wasn't the only place. Eastern, Eastern Tennessee did not, uh, was, not, uh, was, was loyal to the, to the Union. Uh, Western, portions of Western Tennessee where they didn't have uh, plantations, they were loyal to the Union forces as well. Which is one of the reasons why Grant uh, was able to, uh, he was able to uh, uh, guide his army around Vicksburg in order to defeat it, because he was led that way uh, by some of the loyal people that lived in the area. Uh, they have a longer history of slavery and uh, inhumane treatment. Of course, purring sounds like an inhumane thing to do anyway. Uh, so one of the theories that uh, Nesbitt and Cohen came up with in 1996 oh, <laughs> was, oh great, I touched it, now it's going away. What's happening here? Oh no. Yes, I did touch it, I'm sorry. Come on, come back, come back, come back. Ah. <coughs> kind of frustrating, isn't it? So one of the theories that Nesbitt and Cohen came up with was the fact that a lot of people in the South were herders. Uh, a lot of those individuals came from Scotland. Scotland, uh, I, I don't know if you understand the, the history of England, uh, but, oh, there it goes, uh, the history of England, but uh, the Brits were uh, trying to conquer the Scots. <clears throat> And uh, so they, uh, they went into Scotland, and the first battle they fought against them, the Scotch just really beat them up in the battle. Uh, but after that, of course, they didn't lose any battles. I'm not thinking of Braveheart or whatever that movie is. Is that, is it Braveheart? 
uh, with a yellow, crazy Australian guy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not thinking of that movie. That was that was like 200 years before uh, they they conquered them, uh, or, or there there was a revolution in Scotland. Uh, they they did revolt against the English. The English did conquer them, uh, even uh, during Braveheart's time. They they still conquered them. Uh, so later on, they, they tried to rebel, and at that point, uh, the, the Scots won the first battle. They didn't have uh, they didn't have a weapon with the British. The Brits had all kinds of interesting rifles, and uh, the Scots were using uh, swords. And the first battle they won. Oh, gee, what a Christmas! The first battle they won. <laughs> The first battle they won, but after that the, uh, the Brits beat them up pretty bad. Uh, so the Brits decided that uh, they would do uh, the same thing that happened to you guys. Instead of leaving you in your homeland, they would... What is wrong with this thing? <laughs> Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get the other one. I'll be right back. I can't turn that off or, and I have to send it to movies. So entertain the people on the internet. Maybe there isn't anybody on the internet. Everybody's here today. I'll, I'll be with that. So like I said, they did the same thing to those. Oh, now it's working. Who did that? <laughs> Is that right? It's <laughs> such a problem. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. Okay. Well, anyway, so they did the same thing to them that they did to you guys. They, they transported them away. Uh, so they had such a hard time catching these guys in the, in the Scottish Highlands. They had such a hard time catching these guys that they decided that they would just get rid of them. And so they transported them. They transported them to, especially to the south. Uh, they transported them to uh, the southern United States. <laughs> uh, they also transported them to uh, Australia. They transported them to Canada. But they just transported them any place to get, to get rid of them. And they really weren't trying to get rid of them as far as, as the country was concerned. They were trying to get rid of them as far as Scotland was concerned. And it worked. They didn't have any more trouble with the, the, Scot, the Scots Highlands. Okay. They didn't have any, any more trouble with it. 
That's how they're able to get rid of them. The Brits. Anyway, so a lot of the individuals that they sent to the south were Scots-Irish. They were Scots Highlanders. They also sent uh, a bunch of individuals to uh, Northern Ireland. Not Northern Ireland. So if you think about Northern Ireland and you think that the people that live there are Irish, that they are to some extent, but actually most of them are uh, transplants. They're Scotsmen who have been transplanted in Ireland because they were trying to get rid of them. So they sent them to Australia, they sent them to Canada, they sent them to the United States, and they sent them to Northern Ireland, as odd as that may seem. So why in the world would they send them to Northern Ireland? Does that make sense? Why would you send somebody someplace that is dangerous like that? Why would you send them to Ireland? The Irish didn't want them there. And even to this day, the Northern Irish, and I mean, Northern Ireland has lots and lots of trouble. So what in the world, why in the world would they send them there? Why did they put the Salish and Kootenai on the same reservation? Why did they put the Grovog and the uh, Cinnaboyne on the same reservation? Why, why did they put the Northern Cheyenne right next to the Crow? Why would they do that? So they'll kill each other, and that's exactly why they sent it to Northern Ireland. Uh, of course, it's a different group of people, but that's not important, I guess. Anyway. Uh, so sometimes they do things just to get rid of people. And in this case, they were hoping they would kill each other. Just like they were hoping the Northern Cheyenne would kill off the... Uh, would kill off the... Uh, oh, I need to turn this on. The crow, or the crow would kill off the northern Cheyenne. <clears throat> Why are the northern Cheyenne important? Battle of Little Bighorn wasn't just Sioux, it was also northern Cheyenne. The northern Cheyenne were the, the point of the spear. They were the first ones to attack. Anyway, not important. Yes, it is. Of course it's important. I should never have brought that other one down up here anyway. Okay, so we'll go here. There we go. Okay, yeah, that's where we're going. Perfect, okay. All right, so they had have, they have this theory about herders. Now, they already know that the Scots, and I don't know if you know anything about the reputation of the Scots, but the Scots are pretty tough guys. Uh, they, are, they are the bull, the, uh, the strongest portion of the uh, English army are, are the Scotsmen, or the Scots that fight. Uh, the, if you look at the generals' names, they're all Scottish names. What's going on with that? Why does that happen? Because they are really very good fighters. And they're relatively violent people. Okay, so let's send them to the south. And these are herding people. They, of course, they herd sheep. They, they uh, spun wool. They made their clothes out of wool. And I don't know if you've ever worn anything that was wool against your skin, but it's scratchy, itchy, and you don't really want it to be there. Anyway, I don't anyway. But these guys are doing it, you know, they, so they had uh, all this interesting stuff. So as a herder, of course, one of the things you need to show everybody around you is don't mess with me, don't steal my stuff, because I'm, I'm tougher than you are. And that's what we saw with herding communities. That's what we saw in Scotland, and that's what you see in uh, that's what you saw in the South. So they they uh, were herders, and because of that, they were more violent than other individuals. So we have all this violence in the South. Uh, looking at archival data, Nisbet and Cohen in 1997 found that when you compared records of rural North to rural South. They found that not only was the homicide rate higher, but when they compared herding regions of the South with farming regions of the South, the homicide rate was twice as high. So herding has something to do with something. Obviously, it has something to do with something, as far as that goes. Cohen and Nesbitt, uh, in 1994, uh, conducted a telephone interview of Northerners and Southerners and discovered that while they had similar negative feelings about violence, Southerners were more likely to have positive attitudes 
toward defending their families or their honor. So if it had to do with honor, they were willing to go ahead and fight. Northerners, not so much. Honor didn't mean that much to Northerners. It gets, a, it gets real interesting after this. So then they decided that they would, uh, they would insult, they would insult a, a two groups of individuals. One group of individuals were Northerners, the other were Southerners. So they decided that they would insult them, and then they would measure their testosterone level. And when they did that, <clears throat> when they measured their testosterone level, uh, sometimes they, uh, they insulted them and, and other times they didn't. What they discovered was that if you insulted a northerner, his testosterone stayed about the same. His testosterone was about four milligrams and it went, sometimes it went up a little bit, sometimes it didn't. But if you insulted a southerner, it went up three times. From four milligrams to 12.5 milligrams. So if we draw a testosterone on southerners and we draw a testosterone on nor northerners, what do we get? Exactly the same thing. But if you insult them, the testosterone, the sub, they're ready to fight because their testosterone has just tripled. A northerner, you insult him, he laps it off. But that's not the last study they did. <clears throat> then they decided that they would, uh, this was just an insult. So then they decided that they would challenge the individual. So they took a football player <clears throat> and they put them in a narrow hallway. And sometimes they insulted the, uh, the individual before they went into the hallway, and sometimes they didn't insult the individual. They took northerners and, and, and southerners, both northerners and southerners, and they threw them in the, into this hallway with this monster of a, of a person. Somebody had to give way. It wasn't going to be the big fat, the, uh, uh, did I say fat? The, the very large football player. <laughs> he was not going to get out of the way. And he didn't. And of course, he didn't have to because he was twice as big as everybody else. So that was the, uh, the, it was a human game of chicken that they were playing. They wanted to see when they would veer off, as interesting as that is, or not veer off. And this is what they discovered. When they didn't insult the, uh, the individual, when they didn't insult the individual, if they were a northerner, they veered off after, what is, uh, six, uh, 75 inches. 75 inches, they veered off, so they got all the uh, as close as 75 inches, and then they got out of the way, so that the man mountain could, could go past them. That was a northerner. A southerner was even more polite than that. He saw the, the man mountain coming toward him, and at 110 inches, he got out of the way. That's really nice. Southern hospitality. If you've ever been in the South, they'll, they'll do anything for you until you insult them, and then they punch you in the face. Okay. However, if they were insulted, the northerner, if they insulted him, he, he veered at 60 inches. But the southerner didn't veer until 35 inches, like right in the guy's face, and then he got out of the way. Because his testosterone was so high. Remember, these are southerners, and southerners' testosterone goes up three times if you insult them. Okay, so there was a difference between northerners and southerners. Their testosterone is the same as long as everything's going okay. But Southerners, they have a more visceral reaction to insults. So maybe that's the difference between Southerners and Northerners. So I guess the bottom line to this is, if you go down south, try not to insult anybody. Or the south will rise. <laughs> or the south will rise again. Exactly. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> As humorous and, 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 and funny as that is. Okay. Now that means a whole lot to me because, I, like I said, I have a brother who lives in the South and he carries a gun all the time. Uh, I don't carry a gun. I have two brothers, two northern brothers, two brothers that live in Indiana. They don't carry guns at all. And here I've got a, southern, a brother that lives in the South. He carries a gun all the time and claims that, that the world is the most dangerous place, is a terribly dangerous place. So what's wrong with that guy? He lives in the South, where, where people uh, take insults very directly. In the North, people just kind of blow it off. No, they don't care. But in the South, wow, they take, it, they take it to heart. Everything has to do with honor. Okay, we're going to start on Chapter 5. This is the fourth week, so I'm ahead. You can write that down. I'm ahead. <laughs>
I know, I'm so happy. Okay, development and socialization. <laughs> One key adapt adaptation uh, to, that enabled humans to distinguish themselves from the proto-chimpanzee ancestors was the ability to learn and accumulate cultural information so well. Because we are humans. If you look at the chimpanzee, can you tell one chimpanzee culture from the other? Probably not. But humans, of course, we can. We can look at the Chinese and we can see their, how their culture is different from uh, people in Germany, from people in uh, uh, Portugal, from people in uh, the South Sea Islands. We can see that their cultures are completely different. We look at, uh, if, if we look at Native Americans, we can see that your, your culture is certainly different from the guys up north. It's certainly different from the guys back east. It's certainly different from the Kichwe that live down in South America. <clears throat> this adaptation allowed humans to learn the requisite technologies and skills to stake out a successful existence in such diverse environments as the ice-encased Arctic hinterlands, the thick Amazonian jungle, uh, the parched Kalahari Desert, and the dog-eat-dog -dog corporate world of Wall Street. So if we go to up to Alaska, well, let's, we, let's go to Greenland instead. Let's go to Greenland and look at the Inu Inuit. How in the world do those guys survive? And why in the world would anybody live where it's so damn cold? And the answer is because they've learned to adapt to that environment. And their culture has adapted to that environment. What about the people out in the, the Amazon uh, Valley? Uh, if, we have, if we're looking at a, a, a tribal group that lives in the Amazon that have never come in contact with Western man, a lot of these individuals don't wear clothes. Do clothes make any sense in the Amazon River Valley? Well, no, it's right on the equator. It's hot. It's really hot there. So why wear clothes? You don't need clothes unless it gets below 90 degrees. And it never gets below 90 degrees there, except in the at night sometimes, so they don't need clothes. What about the Kalahari Desert? It's hot out there. Or the Sahara Desert, farther north. It's in the 120 degree range, just like down in Phoenix, yeah. So what do you do? Well, you try to stay cool. You try to stay covered. You don't let the sun get to you. And of course, that's what they do in the Kalahari Desert. And of course, Wall Street, we won't even talk about Wall Street. I think they wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not very cold, <laughs> but they're mean to each other. They try to they try to uh, cheat each other so that some one person gets more money than the other. A sensitive period is a period of time in an organism's development that allows for the relatively easy acquisition of a set of skills. The best example I have of this is language skills. And we're going to talk about language skills, but we learn languages until we're about 12 years old, and then our brain, it, our, our brain is pruned, and that language acquiring skill that we have goes away. It's taken out of our brain. And as we're going to see, we have the ability to understand any phonemes. There's like, what did I say, does it say there? 170 phonemes or something. 150 phonemes. There's a lot of different phonemes. But we don't use most of them. We don't need those, all those phonemes. Uh, your language has phonemes that are not in English. And for that reason, a lot of people who try to write your language, they write it incorrectly. They spell things incorrectly. And of course, that happened to almost all the uh, Indian tribes. Uh, they even misidentified their names. So if you look at the, the, uh, the um, uh, Comanche, well, Comanche was a, a Ute word that means enemy. It means the guys that kill, try to kill us all the time is what it means. But they, they didn't call themselves the people that try to kill us all the time. That would be silly. They called themselves the Numina. That's their word for it. So when the guys came through, when the, when the first white people came through and asked, well, who are those guys out there that are so mean? And the Ute guys said, well, they're the Comanche. Everybody knows that. And so that name stuck, not Numina. As as far as that means. You know what Numina means? It means the people. The horse. Almost everybody's tribe means the people. The name means what? The Holy People? <coughs> Children of the Holy People. Yeah. Okay. You know what the Apache called themselves? The Tene. They're the Tene, not the Dene. They're, they're the Tene. Didn't know that anybody. Nobody cares. It's awfully quiet in here. What happened? <laughs> what I say? What is it? 
if an organism misses the chance to acquire those skills, it would uh, have a difficult time doing, doing so later after the sensitive period has expired. And we've seen this with individuals that don't learn to speak, uh, individuals that uh, get no stimulation as children. Uh, these individuals not only do not learn to speak, but they never learn to speak. They can't learn to speak. They, they have gone past this critical period, their sensitive period. Human cultural learning continues throughout the lifespan, of course, uh, but we can't learn everything. Can I learn French? I'm almost 70 years old. Can I learn French? Probably, but I won't pronounce it correctly. I can assure you that I won't pronounce it correctly. I've spoken English all my life. I use English phonemes, so I would try to uh, s speak French just like I speak English. And, of course, the French would make fun of me. Just like if I tried to learn Dene, you guys would make fun of me trying to pronounce the words. <laughs> and that's okay, because I wouldn't be pronouncing it correctly. When I lived up north and I tried, I just tried to say their name. They called themselves the Aani Nin, but of course I didn't pronounce it correctly. And if you knew what, if you spoke their language, you would also tell me that's not right because I didn't speak it. I didn't pronounce it correctly. That's okay. Every time I say the, I, every time I say the name, they correct me. Every time. Even if they tell me and then I, I repeat it, just what I heard. And they say, no, no, that's not right. It's Aani Nen. And I go, Aani Nen? Oh, no, 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 that's not right. So, again, you know, this is a month until I just stop coming across. <laughs> because I can't pronounce the name. And that's okay. Language ability is a hallmark uh, human characteristic. And although there are rudimentary language skills in some other species, no other species is as dependent on language skills or has as complex a language system as humans do. We, have, uh, we know that uh, uh, whales communicate with one another. We know that porpoises communicate with one another. Is it as complex as, as human language? And the answer is no, it's not. It doesn't seem to be. Humans are capable of producing and recognizing and using approximately 150 phonemes. A phoneme is a unit of sound. Buh, cud, the, you know, all the letters of the, of the alphabet. <coughs> Uh, however, no language uses more than 70, 70 of them. The more phonemes that you use, the more complex the language. Uh, a good example would be Finnish. Finnish is one of the most difficult languages to learn of all the languages because it has so many phonemes. It has so many different ways of saying things. So the Finns uh, have a very difficult language to learn. It's a Slavic language, Slavic mixed with uh, Scandinavian language. Scandinavian languages are primarily Germanic languages. This is going to get hard. Yeah, so you mix them all together and you've got the Finnish. People are not able to uh, discriminate easily between phonemes that are not their own language. Uh, the Japanese language does not have separate phonemes for the, the sounds la and ra. So if you speak to a Japanese person, and uh, the Japanese like to practice. The Japanese are really kind of interesting. So they want you to speak English to them so they can speak English back to you. And then, of course, you correct their, theoretically, you correct what they're saying. A lot of times they get L, the L and the R mixed up because they sound the same to them. So they just get them mixed up. So you never know whether they're going to put an R for an L or an L for an, an R or maybe get it right this time. It's really kind of bizarre. You, you, can, you can talk to somebody that's Japanese and they may pronounce it one way and then the next time they pronounce it the opposite way. So they still get it wrong, but to them it, it, it sounds like the same, the same phony. At la and ra. I know. So if, you, if, if you've ever seen this on television, it's, it's a Japanese speaker and they're making fun, not really making fun of him, but this is the way the Japanese actually try to speak English. And they, they'll, they'll get their L's and their R's mixed up. Likewise, the Japanese language does, does not have uh, phonemes for va. Va with a V, V, V off your lip. Although it does have a phoneme for ba. So we have a ba, we, but no va. And they get it mixed up all the time. An adult is expo who is exposed only to the Japanese language cannot perceive the differences between el laws and ras, or between vas and bas, as it turns out. Phonemes that sound obviously different to English speakers, they, they, don't, they can't hear the difference at all. So 
So in Japanese, if you if uh, they're trying to say the word rubber, they can't tell the difference between rubber and lover. It sounds exactly the same to them. How does that make sense? Rubber and lover. I don't know. You can imagine how what how, what kind of trouble you can get into using well with R's and L's. Okay. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, research suggests that uh, young infants can discriminate among uh, all the phonemes that, that uh, humans are able to produce. Uh, so they can hear all 150. Uh, this is usually before they start speaking themselves. You can. We'll see you later, Joe. Take it easy. I don't like your hat. But... <laughs> I hate your hat, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a Dodgers fan, ever. My mother was a Dodgers fan. There was something wrong with her. It was like the only thing that was wrong with her was she was a Dodgers fan. Otherwise than that, she was pretty normal other than that. <sighs> My dad was a Yankees fan. My God, what's wrong with her? I know, both of my parents are just stupid about baseball. <laughs> I, of course, am a Giants fan. They can't win, and they've lost like seven games in a row. Ugh. I'm so depressed. Native English-speaking babies uh, of six to eight months are reliably, can reliably distinguish between two sounds from the Hindi language. But then they lose that capability at uh, the 10 to 12 month mark. They lose it. It's gone. They can't tell the difference. But they can tell the difference at, at uh, 6 to 8 months. They can tell the difference between all these different phonemes. All of a sudden it's gone. So why did it go away? What happened to it? Why did it disappear? Well, they're only eight months old. They can't even talk yet. They can't even say ma yet, I don't think, usually. What happened to that? What happened to it? What can't, well, all of a sudden, they can't, they can't distinguish between the Hindi phonemes. They could, they could understand all 150 before. Now they can't understand any. What happened to it? Why did it disappear? We're constantly pruning our brains, getting rid of things we don't need. And that's what happened. They just pruned that out right out of their brains. They don't need it anymore. Even for a four-day-old infant already shows a preference for the rhythm of sounds from their own language over, their, over other languages. They've done experiments where they've taken a newborn baby and they've, they've played a record that is a different language than the one that their mother and their father speak. They will have a preference. They will turn toward the record that is the sounds of their own language, as bizarre as that is. If they have a father that speaks uh, English and a mother that speaks Spanish, <coughs> they will prefer both of those languages. Having listened to both of them in, their, in the womb, of course, in order for them to hear the language, you have to get really close to them because they're listening through all that water, all the yeah. amniotic fluid. So, but they can hear that, and they can hear the, the music of the language, the rhythm of the language, and they will respond to that, that language. And if you speak it incorrectly, if you speak it with a different rhythm, they won't pay attention to you, as interesting as that is. Uh, the research that they did, they used Russian, French, and English. And uh, the uh, individuals spoke English, and they rejected the French, they rejected the Russian, and they uh, turned toward the uh, English language. So they've done this, this experiment over and over and over again, and what they've discovered is children actually can hear in the womb, and they will uh, respond to the language that they've heard. This research suggests that we are biologically prepared to attend to human speech as we come into this world, we are predisposed to start picking up languages at a very early age, and we do. It's amazing. And you can try to teach your child to speak. It really doesn't matter. 
they're still going to learn to speak at about the same age. No matter how much you harass them uh, to say mama, they will always say dada first. <laughs> and the reason is because it's easier to say dada than it is to say mama. Uh, as it turns out, they learn to speak with the inside of their mouth before they learn to speak with the outside of their mouth. So dada is farther, uh, is, is, is more inside your mouth. Dada, mama, mama, they have to use their lips. So it's easier to say dada than mama. So they'll usually say dada first. I think there's a, observing a lot of my sons on classes and they use phone phones. The, the alphabet, like ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, Uniscript. Yeah. Is it Uniscript? They use those, like, alphabets. What, they have those weird yeah. writings? Yeah. Yeah. They call it Uniscript. Yeah. 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 This is new thing, I guess. Has the, does it work? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. He, has a, he has a hard time pronouncing, but his, his language is coming together really good. But when they put it all together and make the word, they put the word together and use the, the, the sign language. Sounds so hard. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have a PhD. I'm not exactly sure. I've got the brain power to do that. That sounds so hard. Early in life, before puberty, our brains are especially pliable for organizing themselves in response to language input. Later on, our brains, of course, are not so flexible. We prune out that portion. So learning languages after that is not that easy. I learned Spanish when I was a junior in high school. And I speak Spanish just like somebody from Indiana would speak Spanish. I have a horrible, horrible Hoosier accent. Say uh, something. I'm sorry? Say something. Un poquito. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I only speak a little bit. I can read it though. I can read Spanish, which is kind of exciting. And I can speak, uh, read Portuguese and German, but I, I don't speak it very well because I speak it with a uh, with a Hoosier accent. You know, it's just it just doesn't sound right. What was I listening to the other day? Oh, they were. I was trying to figure out if bong, B-O-N-G, which means paraphernalia for smoking marijuana, was a French word or not. Bon voyage with an N, but if you put a G on it, it's bon voyage. But it, exactly, it's not because the French don't pronounce B O N G like that. They pronounce it ba, ba. Uh, it's just ba, ba, ba. I kept playing it over and over again, going, "Wait a minute, that's what do they say?" And they, How about in other countries where they use that the clicking sound? Uh, you guys use a clicking sound to, to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But uh, the only other language, the only other time I've heard it is uh, the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert. They use it. They, they have a click language, which is really interesting. I'm listening to them speak because they have a click behind almost every word. And sometimes it comes from the side of their tongue, sometimes it comes from their teeth, you know, the clicking sound. So it's really kind of fascinating. How complex is their language? Humans are, are better at acquiring and mastering languages early in life than they are later on. So if you're going to learn a foreign language, if you're going to teach foreign languages, you should teach it before the age of 12, before they're in the sixth grade. And if you do, they will speak the language without an accent, as interesting as that is. Uh, I took my kids to Germany. Um, my son was, wait a minute, I took them there in 79. My son was born in 72. So he was seven and my daughter was 10. And both of them speak German without an accent. When they speak German, they can speak it without an accent. Now, interestingly, my son also speaks Spanish that he learned out in California. Uh, most of the words he used, you, you, you can't repeat, but uh, <laughs> he learned it on the soccer field. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he learned it in the kitchen, uh, but he, he teaches um, ESL Spanish, or uh, English, uh, in Florida now, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but of course, he knows when they're swearing at him, because <laughs> those are the words he learned first. But because he learned German without an accent, 
Now we speak Spanish without that. As curious, curious as that is. So when he speaks Spanish, to me, I understand what he's saying. When I say it back to him, he says, Dad, you've got the worst accent in the world. And he's right. I have the worst accent in the world. <laughs> I speak like a Hoosier, and there's nothing I can do about it. I, don't, I speak English with a, with a Hoosier accent. So instead of saying wash, I say wash. Instead of saying color, color, I can't even say it. Instead of whatever this damn thing is, I say color just like it's a hue or something. It's sad. From Indiana, it's just the worst thing in the world. For bilinguals who learn a second language later in life, one part of their brain is active when they hear their second language, and another when they hear their native language. Both, of course, both of these parts are in the Broca's area. This is Broca's, Broca's area. It's on the left side of your brain. It's right here. So if you get a blow to the head and, and it injures this part of your brain, then potentially you will not only not be able to speak, but you won't understand when somebody's talking to you which is one of the reasons when you get a concussion, we say, how many fingers am I holding up? We need you to respond to us. And if you can't speak, then we know that you have a damage to your brokers area. And if you don't understand what we're saying, if you keep going, huh, huh, then we know you've got damage to the brokers area. Bilinguals who learned their second language early in life showed activation in the same part of the brain regardless of whether they were hearing their second language or their native language. So if somebody learns a language from birth, uh, and of course uh, if those of you who, who have been speaking English and, and Diné uh, for your entire lives, uh, actually your, entire, your, your brain will light up the same for both languages. If you didn't learn Diné until later in life, you probably have a little bit of trouble pronouncing some of the phonemes, uh, but also, uh, it, you utilize more of your brain for the second language than you do for your primary language. Now, because my, my kids learned German uh, when they were in Germany, uh, the, and they spoke German without an accent, uh, my son was able to uh, incorporate that knowledge into Spanish, and, and now he speaks Spanish without an accent. Which is kind of interesting because he, speaks, he, uh, he uh, teaches in Florida. And in Florida, they not only have uh, people coming up from South America, but they also have people coming in from uh, Mexico. Uh, so there's several different dialects that are being, sec several different Spanish dialects that are being spoken. And uh, of course, he has to uh, interpret all the different dialects and all the different swear words, which is really kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, he's a mean soccer player, so he got sworn at a lot. Uh, and uh, of course, I can speak all my German swear words because I played G soccer in Germany, and they used to call me all kinds of horrible names. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> as much fun as that is. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at all these individuals and see if they, if their culture handles children differently. In 2007, Keller looked at uh, rearing practices of urban middle-class Germans, urban middle-class Greeks, and urban middle-class Costa Ricans. Uh, Keller also looked at rural Indian uh, Gujarati and Cameroonians. Cameroon is in the middle of, of Africa. And of course, uh, Guj the Gujarati are uh, over by the Punjab in India. So we've got two rural groups and we have three urban groups. And they wanted to see if they dealt with their children differently. Observing how much bodily contact the parents had with their infants, Keller found that the European parents spent the least time in contact with their infants. So looking at all of these individuals, it was the Europeans that spent the least time uh, touching their children. There's a shock for you. So they were looking at Greeks and Germans. This is a, a German lady. The infants from the other cultural groups spent the majority of their time being held by their, uh, by their mothers. So the mothers held them despite the fact that uh, they may not be interacting with them, they were still holding them. During Keller's observation in 2007, there was not a single observation when the Cameroonian infant wasn't being held by its mother. 
So the Cameroonian mother held the child all the time. They didn't put the child down ever. They always were holding the child. The child was always touching the mother. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of a Cameroonian woman. There's her baby. She's got it slung on her back. And as you can see, the baby's asleep and the mother's teaching biology. This is a soldier ant. Okay. <laughs> She's teaching uh, biology in German, or in, uh, in, in English. Another variable that uh, Keller investigated was the amount of face-to-face -face contact the mothers had with their infants. Urban European mothers spent most of their contact time in face-to-face -face contact. This is not true of other mothers, especially the Gujarati. Despite the fact that this is true, I've got a picture of a Gujarati woman uh, touching noses with her baby, even though that's not common in the Gujarati culture. So the European uh, mothers uh, spent most of their time in face-to-face -face contact, talking to their children, having their children right in front of them so that they could see them face-to-face. -face. They were looking eye-to-eye -eye with their children. The responses of the German mothers were more uh, contingent to the baby's cries and behaviors uh, than was found with the Cameroonian mothers, and this cultural difference predicted how quickly the babies learned to recognize themselves in a mirror. Because they responded to the child, the child realized that he was a separate, or that, that, uh, the that they were a separate individual than the mother was. Because they spent, uh, because all they needed to do was, was uh, create a stimulus and the mother would react to it. So they realized that they were different. This is one of the things that babies have a difficult time uh, understanding. Sometimes they feel that they are part of the, the mother-child unit or the caregiver-child unit. And so they don't see themselves as separate. Now this is something that, we, that the, they saw with the Cameroonian mothers. Remember, the Cameroonian mothers never put their babies down. So the babies had a more difficult time understanding that they weren't part of this mother-child unit, that, that this was a constant. Uh, the German children, of course, were, were separated from their mothers. They had face-to-face, -face, they had a lot of face-to-face -face contact where they could read the mother's expression. The Cameroonian mothers, here's a picture, whoops, that's not a Cameroonian mother. Okay, this is, this is what happened with Cameroonian mothers. They slung the baby on their back a lot. They didn't see faces. They saw the, their mother's back. So even when they weren't doing anything with the baby, the baby was still in contact with the mother and they were looking at the mother's back. So there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of face to face contact. The German mothers on the other hand and the German infants uh, were more likely to, to recognize the fact that they were separate from their mothers. Uh, learning that others will respond to their cries facilitates uh, infants' recognition that they have a distinct identity. And of course, that's one of the things that European uh, children realized uh, before, other, before other cultural groups. Urban European babies tend to occupy their, their own physical space, and they are often in face-to-face -face contact with their mothers, putting them in a position to interact with their mothers as separate beings. As in, as in turn taking conversations and their mothers are more responsive to their individual needs. So the, the Cameroonian mothers, of course, they know exactly what the baby needs because the baby's on, his, on their back, they've been interacting with them 24-7 uh, for an extended length of time. So when the baby has a need, the mother recognizes it probably before the baby has to respond, uh, has to give a stimulus. The European uh, child, on the other hand, in order to get the mother's attention, they have to cry. And that, at, at that point, of course, they make face-to-face -face contact with the, uh, uh, with the mother, and then they, uh, they realize early that they are a different entity than, that mother, than the mother is. And it is, uh, uh, they, the mother will respond to them, but they have to create a stimulus for the mother to respond to. So if we're looking at all these babies, which one would cry the most? Who would cry the most of all these babies? So, yeah, the European baby would cry more. The, the uh, Cameroonian baby wouldn't have to cry. All they'd have to do would be to move in an uncomfortable fashion, and the mother would realize, oh, I've got to change the diaper again. Jeez. <laughs> or she feels feel something wet leaking down her, her back. That sounds pleasant. 
<laughs> in other cultures, infants share the same physical space with their mothers. The mothers are not as likely to be in a position to interact with their infants through face-to-face -face contact. And in a lot of these cases, there would be very little face-to-face -face contact. Well, when they were changing their diapers, I guess. In some regions of Africa, the Caribbean, and India, infants receive a daily massage and an uh, exercise regime, uh, such as stretching their limbs or putting them into sitting positions. These experiences uh, shape their development, and those uh, who receive this kind of massage and exercise begin to sit on their own and walk at an earlier age than those that do not. Does all that make sense? They massage them and they put them on an exercise uh, regime. They'll put them on a table and they'll have them walk. I did this with my own kids, not because I read any of this stuff. My, my kids are old. My, kid, my daughter's 49. I just figured this out. She's 49 and my son's 47. So it was 49 and 47 years ago that I was teaching my children to walk. But the thing, I wanted them to walk really fast, and I thought it was kind of cool. So I would have them hold on to my fingers and walk along, and I'd walk along with them. And we did that, and we did that a lot. My wife didn't do it because she didn't like kids that much. <laughs> kids weren't her favorite thing. But I just I was just having a ball with these guys. And uh, my son started to, to walk at age eight months, and my daughter started walking at age nine months. So it worked, obviously. And neither of them ever, ever crawled. They never crawled at all. Never. My uh, niece, I have a niece, uh, and she uh, would scoot along on her butt. She wouldn't, she didn't crawl either. She scooted along on her butt. I have a nephew who did that too, like sideways, like <clears throat> his arm and he just like slides. They're swimming along. <laughs> it's so funny. With, with really an odd crazy. look on their faces while they're doing it. Yeah, it's crazy because he has a better walk than all of us. Uh, cultural practices such as putting infants to sleep on their backs uh, rather than their stomachs can delay the children be, uh, beginning to, uh, when they begin to crawl, roll over, or learn to stand because, of course, they're not getting the same stimulation. In cultures that do not encourage crawling, large proportions uh, of the children never crawl but instead scoot along on their butts or proceed directly to, to walking. That's what my kids did. They didn't really scoot along on their butts. They just kind of stood up and took off, which uh, I told you that my wife left when my son was nine months old. One of the reasons she left was because she was so irritated with the kid because he kept, kept getting into things. And evidently, he, you know, he's just a little bitty guy, but evidently he had a really long arm and he could get into things. So she had the, the house baby proofed, you know, at this height, but here he was, he was grabbing stuff off the table, you know, he was pulling the, the, uh, the uh, tablecloth off, grabbing a hold of it, and falling backwards and pulling the thing off on, on top of it. And it kind of irritated her a little bit. She took off with some other guy, so I don't know that it had to do with the fact that he kept pulling stuff off, off on him. Okay, we've got a question for everybody here, just a second. Uh, if you are of European descent and grew up in North American uh, North American household, the odds are that your parents set aside a room in, your, in, your, in their house, perhaps decorating it with pastel colors and scenes of romping bunny rabbits, and put a crib in it for you to sleep in, potentially. And if they had enough room, they, they had a special baby room. And you see this in movies, and this goes way, way back into the 30s and 40s, that people were creating rooms for their children. In a study of 136 societies, Infants in two-thirds of these groups slept in the same bed as their mothers. In a majority of the other cases, infants slept in the same room as their mothers, but in a different bed. American parents were the only ones in a survey of 100 societies who created a separate room for the baby to sleep in. Only, Amer only in America do, they, do, do the babies get their own room. The practice of co-sleeping is also quite common in other subcultures in the United States. Uh, Co-sleeping is common among African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanics. The practice of people sleeping separately in their own beds has not yet been identified in a single subsistence society around the world. So Americans are the only ones that do it. We are the only ones. 
Okay, here's, here, here is the formula. Here's what you have to figure out. How in the world are you going to uh, create bedrooms for all these people? Schwader in, uh, at all in 1995 developed a study where they gave participants a scenario as to how a house, how to house a family of three bedrooms consisting of a mother, a father, a son who's 15 years old, a son who's 11 years old, a son who's 8 years old, a daughter that's 14, and a daughter that's 3. So how would you do it? You've got three bedrooms and you've got all these people to put in those bedrooms. So how would you do it? How would you do it? Um, add on to the house. No. <laughs> uh, bedroom for everyone. Yeah. Come on, we're Donald Trump here. We can do anything we want. So separate. Huh? Gender. My gender? Yeah. Boy, 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 girl, girl, mom and dad. Is that what you do? Brady Bone style. Brady Bone style. Does that make sense? Logical? Boys in one room, girls in another. Boys in one room. Mom and dad get their own room. Yeah, that's not right. Mom and dad. You should share. <laughs> Same way. You mean the 15 year old boy? Yes. He gets his own room? And then the two, the 11, the two sons, and the 8 and 11. Okay, 11 and, and 8 are in another room. One room, and the two girls can share the room. With you? And, you, and the old man? Yeah. And you, got, you got a father? Well, the little one can probably share the room with the parents. With the parents, okay. So the 3 year old is in with mom and dad. The 15-year-old is all by himself. And then um, the last one <laughs> The 11-year-old the son, the 8-year-old son, and the 14-year-old daughter are all together in one group, in yes. one bedroom? Okay. All right. Um, what do you think? The 3-year-old daughter would sleep with the mother and father. Okay. And all the sons, one room, and then the daughter, one room. The oldest daughter. Oh, she, so the eldest daughter gets your own room. Yeah. We saw, we saw this on Brady Bunch, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> the same thing, based on gender. Gender? Boys and gender. Boys and boys and girls and girls? Okay. Well, let's see how everybody else did it. 88% of Americans, given the scenario, choose the uh, following configuration. Mom and dad in one room. Uh, the two daughters share the room two. And then the three sons share the other room. And this is known as the Brady Bunch solution. <laughs> Just like Francis said, it's the Brady Bunch solution. <laughs> Americans seek to avoid incest. That's very logical. Almost all cultures do. Uh, the second most important principle was the sacred couple. So mom and dad get to a, a room all by themselves because they are the sacred couple. A married couple should be given their own space for emotional intimacy and sexual privacy, of course. Uh, the third most important principle is autonomy. Uh, the belief that young children who are needy and vulnerable should learn to be self-reliant and take care of themselves. This is a, an American concept, the, this concept of self-reliance, that kids need to take, figure out how to take care of themselves, even at a young age. Now, this is a really kind of an odd picture. This is the, uh, this is the uh, sacred couple here, but this baby down here has got a skull. I have no idea what that's all about. Anyway, I don't know where I found the picture. <laughs> it's just a little spooky. I don't know what that baby's doing with that skull. It must be something. <clears throat> uh, when people in India were given the same scenario, they based their answers on the following four, four criteria. They needed to avoid incest, of course. 
uh, post-pubescent children of the, the opposite sex should not sleep in the same room. That is inviting incest. Protection of the vulnerable. Young children should not be left alone at night, ever. Female chastity, anxiety, post-pubescent females should always be chaperoned by someone. Respect for hierarchy, post-pubescent boys are con uh, conferred social status by not having their, them sleep with their parents or with other young children in the family. So this is the most popular configuration in India. The mother, the father, and the three-year-old daughter. Just like Tiffany said, bedroom two, the 14-year-old daughter, and the eight-year-old son, interestingly enough. In bedroom three, the 15-year-old son and the 11-year-old son. That was the most popular configuration in India. But the second most popular configuration was for, in bedroom one, the father and the eight-year-old son were together. In bedroom two, the 15-year-old son and the 11-year-old son. And then in bedroom three, the mother, the three-year-old daughter, and the 14-year-old daughter were, to, were together. Protecting everybody from everybody else, I guess. So uh, that was, the, uh, that was the, the second most popular configuration in India, where they have different ideas than we have in the United States. Uh, we watch too much television, of course, and so we do everything just like the Brady Bunch does. Everything. If you've ever seen either the television show or the movie. North American children live in an environment where they are by themselves uh, from a very early age and must cry out to their parents when they have needs to be taken care of. And that is the way it works in, the West, in North America. Children from many other cultures, in contrast, may live in an environment uh, where their mother is always around. Often, as in many cultures, the children are literally carried by their mother throughout the day, as we saw with the Cameroonians. Mothers do not need to be called uh, to, as they are always present to respond to the children's needs. So in Western society, especially in North American society, uh, we try to teach our children to be uh, self-reliant. And in order for them to, to get the uh, parents' attention, uh, they have to call out to their parents for help. And of course, they will do this uh, for an extended length of time. Uh, curiously, uh, I don't know if I can mention this or not. Let me think. Okay. Sure, why the hell? Why the hell? Uh, <laughs> curiously, uh, if you've ever, well, none of you have ever been in this situation. Uh, in combat, uh, one of the things that you notice when somebody gets wounded, a lot of times they'll call out for their mother. But that only happens in people from the Western world. They'll call out for their mother when they get shot. Or if they think they're going to die, they'll call out for their mother. Very common. Very, very common. So when we were fighting the Germans in World War I, this is one of the things that we noticed. Both sides would, would call for their mothers. Uh, not only when we were fighting them, but the French were fighting them, Mama, you know, so that kind of a deal. And the English would do the same thing. However, when we were fighting the Japanese during World War II, one, one of the things that, and we used this as propaganda, they didn't call out for their mothers. They called out to uh, Hirohito, they called out to the, the uh, uh, Bushido spirits instead of to their mothers. And we thought that they were cold-hearted. We thought that they were, they were cold-hearted. Same thing happened in uh, Korea with, uh, with the Koreans. Uh, same thing happened in Vietnam. Uh, so whenever, if they were wounded uh, or they were shot and they were, uh, they were calling out, you know, they were out of their heads and they're calling out to somebody, they would usually call out to, their, uh, to, to, to whatever spirit they, uh, they recognized, as interesting as that is. But uh, North, North Americans, of course, we call out to our mothers as curiously as that is. Having worked in a medical facility, I can tell you that that was fairly common. Uh, in 1971, Baumrind uh, published her tripartite typology of parenting styles. Uh, the first style is the author authoritarian parenting style. The authoritarian parenting style is the Victorian parenting style. It was fairly cold, uh, the f especially the father. The father wasn't supposed to interact with the children at all. Uh, if he did interact with the children, it was to praise them or to punish them. Uh, but he didn't interact, he didn't show uh, affection for his children. The mother sometimes did, but the, the father never did. 
low, the authoritarian parenting, low levels of warmth or responsiveness to the parents uh, of the parents uh, to the child's protests. Uh, then in the 1950s and 1960s, we changed our parenting styles uh, and uh, we uh, developed a child-centered approach to parenting. And so the authoritative style is more of a 1950s, 1960s uh, type parenting style. Uh, this is where the parents maintain a, a high expectations of maturity for their children. Uh, there is a, uh, a great deal of warmth with the authoritative style, but they also have control over the children. That's the authoritative style. And then in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, we realized that, uh, or some people thought, that uh, the uh, parenting styles in the United States weren't working, the authoritarian Victorian style wasn't working, the authoritative style wasn't working. So the hippies decided that they would be more permissive with their children. They'd let, them, they'd let the children do whatever they wanted to do. Freedom was the, most, was the byword for this parenting style. So the permissive parenting style uh, is one where the uh, parents are, are involved with their children. Um, they do show warmth and responsiveness to their children, but the uh, children, they, they don't put any limits uh, or controls on their children's behavior. And of course, Baumrin came up with this in 1971. Uh, she was starting to see this permissive parenting style uh, in the hippie movement. Uh, there were a lot of... Uh, um, communes uh, around the United States where individuals were team uh, raising children uh, in groups as odd as that may seem. Uh, so we saw these three different uh, parenting styles uh, as uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, as representative of uh, select groups and select uh, uh, eras in the United States. Victorian, uh, this was post-World War II, was the authoritative parenting style, and then this was the hippie movement in the, uh, si the late 60s, early 70s, as fascinating as that is. But there's, around the world, there's lots and lots of different parenting styles. <clears throat> uh, Chow in 1994 argues that training is a core part of Chinese parenting. And for that reason, their parenting style has nothing to do with, with the United States. It is totally different from, from anything that we see in the United States. So they're trying to train their child to uh, live in the, in, this, in the society. And since the Chinese are a collectivist society, then you have to learn to be like everybody else. If you stick out in Chinese, Japanese, uh, uh, in uh, East Asian society, then that's not good. You shouldn't, should never stick out. You need to be part of the group. That's, that's the most important thing. So as far as the Chinese parent is concerned, it, they are trying to train you to be just like everybody else. So there's a lot of training that takes place. It is an effort to have the children adhere to socially desired behaviors, often by providing the child with explicit examples of proper behavior. This is how you do, this is how you, wait a minute, that's a song. <laughs> and it entails much devotion and sacrifice on the part of the parents because they have to stay on top of you all the time. So they're sacrificing. Uh, the mother doesn't work so that she can train her children to be good children. The father works, and he works a lot. He works as much as both parents would, would work together. And he works, and he's never home. And the mother, it's, she sacrifices whatever her career could potentially be, to take care of that child and to train them the way that they're supposed to be. I know, interesting places. Uh, contrary to Western findings, strong parental control has been found to be associated with increased family cohesion, perceived parental warmth and acceptance, and better academic achievement in China, Japan, and Korea. This works for them. Would it work in the United States? Uh, yeah, it does. It can. It can work in the United States. Chinese parents that come to the United States, uh, their children are very successful. They're very successful academically. They're very su successful artistically. They're very successful people. They become successful people. Why? Because they live in a cohesive family unit. And because there is a lot of parental control, they see it as warmth and acceptance. They're not ignored by their, by their parents. They've always got their mother there, this tiger mother, this individual that is 
telling them what to do. And of course, uh, because of that, they are very successful in the United States when they come to the United States. Okay. The European American high school students uh, viewed uh, any pressure by their mother uh, to be largely negative and indicative that they didn't feel supported by their mother. You don't believe in me, you won't let me do my own thing. That's the way a Western child would, would see uh, their mother trying to control them. However, the Asian American high school student didn't view maternal pressure in a negative term. They saw it as a positive thing. She cares about me. And if she didn't pay any attention to her, her child, if she allowed him or her to do whatever they wanted to do, he, they would in, interpret it as they don't like me. They, they don't care about me. They would see it as a negative rather than a positive. And in a Western home, uh, the more the mother tries to control the child, the more they feel like they're being put upon. They see less warmth, as confusing as that is. <clears throat> when Asian American students reflected on their mother pressuring them to, hard, uh, to work hard on a task, they were more motivated to complete a task on their own. So they didn't need their mother there to try hard in everything. They wouldn't go to the prom. Why? Because they're wasting study time. Everybody knows that. You shouldn't, go to, you shouldn't go out with your friends. That's a waste of time. You need that time to study for, the, for an exam. You've got a 98 on the test. You've got an A. What does the mother talk about? Does she talk about the 98% that you got right? Or does she talk about the 2% that you missed? The one question that you missed? You stupid child, you missed that question. It was an easy question. You should have gotten it right. That's what the, the Asian mother will do as strange as that may seem. Japanese adolescents even feel rejected by their parents when they experience only little parental control and a broader range of autonomy. So autonomy to somebody in Japan means that your parents don't care about you. In the United States, it means that they trust you. So in the United States, you're more likely to, to do what you need to do. But in Japan, of course, you feel like your parents don't care about you. They don't care if you live or die. However, authoritarian parenting styles are defined by Baumrind in 1971, have been found to be associated with more stressed mothers, uh, and to lead to increased psychological maladjustment among children across a variety of both Western and non-Western cultures, including the Chinese. So the authoritarian parenting style, where they don't show any affection at all, is of course seen as negative, or they don't show a lot of affection. In general, children are less happy with strongly controlling parents, and this effect is found across many cultures. So the more control they try uh, to have on you, the uh, less the children appreciate it. There are obvious differences between the parenting philosophies of North American and Chinese parents. North American uh, children uh, come to learn that they are independent uh, agents to which their mothers respond, whereas the Chinese children learn that they are relational beings who need to respond to their mothers. So it has to do with collectivism and individualism. In a collectivist society, they see it as, I have to get along with everybody and my mother is trying to teach me that. But of course, in, in North America, we wouldn't see that. Uh, we, we see strength in, in our independence and autonomy. We see strength in our mother allowing us to do whatever we want to do. And so we try to do the right thing, don't we? Or do we try to rebel? Who are you going to rebel against? The, uh, the strict parent or the authoritative parent? The one that allows you to have autonomy. Wow, this is a tough one, isn't it? Who are you going to rebel against? Who's the worst person in the whole wide world? Oh, that's your parents. That's, everybody knows that. <laughs> So who would you be more likely to rebel against? I guess it all depends on whether it's a collectivist or an individualistic uh, uh, social structure. Oops. North American mothers are more likely to discuss their, children, their child's successes and positive emotional experiences uh, with, the with the child, uh, thereby emphasizing what the child is able to accomplish. So they talk about all the positives. North American parents do. Oh, you got to... You got a 75 on that test. 
You got 75% of them right. Way to go. That's good. Great. How's it make you feel? <laughs> Chinese mothers are, are most likely to call attention to their child's mistakes and, and transgressions, thereby elaborating on how the child needs to change to fit in better. Oh, you still missed those two. You stupid child. What's wrong with you? Why, did, why don't you get them all right? Your sister got them all right. Why don't you get them all right? Well, your sister took that test. <clears throat> now, the strange thing is that if you read children's literature in, in uh, East Asia and you read children's literature in the United States, we're reading Dr. Zeus, we're reading things that make us feel good, and they're reading things that teach them something. So uh, we have heroes uh, in, in our children's books. We have heroes. Uh, this person wasn't a very good soccer player, and then they practiced really hard, and then they, they uh, stopped the goal that would have won the game for the other team. Yay, so he's a hero. That's the way our children's stories are. The children's stories in, in East Asia are the opposite. <sighs> so he was playing on the soccer team, he was a really good goalie, he didn't practice very much, and then his team lost. Oh, if you practice hard, you will become a good soccer player. See, that's, that's what they're trying to teach them. In the United States, ours are positive. In East Asia, they're negative. They're, most of their uh, children's stories are negative stories. Talking about mistakes that people make. As interesting and fascinating as that is. So if you've ever heard a Chinese, if you've ever been around a, a Chinese parent, or a Japanese parent or a Korean parent, a lot of times they seem to be really down on their kid. They, they're complaining about like everything. Jeez, the kid got a hundred. What are you complaining about? You didn't study hard enough. What do you mean? You got a hundred on the test. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. So it's really hard being a teacher around uh, people from East Asia because the parents want you to crack down on their kids. They want you to Tell the kids when they do, do something wrong, even if they're the best kid in the class. You can't tell them that. <clears throat> Around the age of 18 months, young children enter a period of accelerated word learning. Uh, when their vocabularies begin to increase dramatically, a great deal of research has indicated that this increase in vocabulary is not distributed equally across all different forms of words. Now this gets really bizarre. The first words that children learn are nouns. In the West, we learn nouns first. So if you're going to learn a language, and I've been talking about this forever, if you're going to learn a language, they need to give you a list of nouns to learn first. That's the way you learn it when you're a kid. So you learn ball, car, dog. You learn all the nouns first. So if you're learning a new language, the best way to learn it should be to learn the nouns first. But that's not the way it works in East Asia. We'll stop right here, and we'll pick this up next time. They don't learn nouns first. As bizarre as that seems, there's something wrong with those guys. What's wrong with them? <laughs> Their mothers are mean. That's what's wrong with them. <laughs> uh, my mother was mean, too, but she really liked my, seven, my C's. My 75s, she thought that was great. She thought I was the dumbest kid in the world. She's wrong, I'm not the dumbest kid in the world. <laughs> I don't think I am. <laughs> uh, my mother used to call me, you stupid kid. That's not very nice. Not anymore. I'm not a kid anymore. That made me stupid. <laughs> Your book is coming. I ordered it. Okay. Uh, it's got kind of an obscene title. Please, please don't be offended. Wow, I got a telephone. I bet you can. <laughs> this is no one. Uh, the title is uh, German Men Pete when they sit down and they That's the title of the book. I hope you're not offended by it. You're naming German men. <clears throat> My wife had been in Germany for two days. 
She's driving down the Autobahn, gets off the Autobahn, and there's a German uh, uh, military truck that has just stopped on the side of the road. All these guys are getting out and they're urinating on the side <laughs> of the <that> road. <laughs> She'd been there for two days. And what does she see? She sees all these German men just urinating and turning around and smiling at her, which was kind of funny. But then again, that's Germans for you. They urinate in public, <laughs> and they're not embarrassed by it. <laughs> uh, German soldiers, I swear. Well, I guess that's what I guess that's where the phrase takes place. When you gotta go, you gotta go. You gotta go exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they, evidently, they've been oh, here, well, I'm talking about urinating, and I'm, I'm talking to the people on.